progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. A happy Sabbath. As we come before the Lord today, as we seek his guidance, as we read and study from his word, shall we seek him so that our minds might be open and these items might be better explained for our use in this work that is yet to come. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we see around us many signs that this earth and its history are about to close. We see our great need of you. We see, Father, the sin that has created the conditions in this earth and recognize that without you, there is no peace, that there is no true joy, that there is no sweet love. Help us today. May your will be done. May we be guided by these words. May we be directed in the path that you would have us to follow. May our hearts be open. May our minds be clear. Do with us today as is necessary. So that we may seek you with our whole heart. For this, Father, for this opportunity, for this time, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, as we open this portion from the spirit of prophecy <clears throat> we have a title before us whatsoever a man soweth that shall he reap this is not an easy message this is not a message of peace and safety. <clears throat> this is a message that calls us to recognize that today, whatever we sow, this is what we will reap. This is where our hearts will be. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. Galatians 6, 7. I want to sow for time and eternity. My heart hungers and thirsts after righteousness. I want my life hid in Christ Jesus, that my sowing shall bring me the right kind of harvest. I feel deeply in regard to my own self. For every day in words or in actions, I am sowing either tares or wheat. I want to sow for time and eternity. I have lived nearly the period of my allotted time. And what shall the harvest be? Each one of us needs to examine our lives according to these words.
I want a quiet and unwavering trust in the Most High. I have experienced his protecting care in a remarkable manner when following in the path of duty. I want to go down in the grave as a shock of corn fully ripe. I want no complaining in my heart, only gratitude should abide there. God's mercy and his loving kindness are to be kept, not as a thing out of mind, but as something so precious as never to be forgotten. As eyewitnesses of his majesty, we may exalt and praise his holy name. We are with him in the holy mount. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, if we take these admonitions to heart, how much of a change are we going to see in our lives and in how we approach others? Can someone else read this next paragraph, please? <clears throat> Every moment of time is precious and weighty with eternal consequences. We are in a world of appearances which mock and deceive like the apples of Sodom. Oh, how the Lord looks upon the double dealing and the duplicity which is in our world. If we could not get a glimpse above and beyond if we could if we could not get a glimpse above and beyond the clouds to the bright beams of the sun of righteousness we might well be downcast but jesus lives the bow of promise encircles the throne as a constant assurance that jesus lives and because he lives we shall live also and that of course John 14, 19. Mm -hmm. Whatever may be the needed discipline of the church militant amid the dragon's wrath against those who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus, the benediction is pronounced upon all who love and obey God. The words are positive, but mark their significance. The Alpha and Omega does not utter words that will lead any soul to suppose that a profession of faith without willing, genuine love and what? Obedience will secure him, will secure to him the entrance into the holy city and a right to the tree of life. The Lord declares, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Matthew 15, eight. This is mockery to God speaking with a mouth of guile. As we were addressing in other studies, here is 158. 158 BC being the time where the Jewish nation sought a league with Rome. <clears throat> this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips but their heart is far from me. How can our heart be close to that of Christ if we are seeking a league with that which is not of Christ? This is mockery to God speaking with a mouth of guile. The discipline in the school of Christ will cause the church to lean upon the arm of her beloved. The redeemed of the Lord shall at last come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads in victorious triumph. 
all the angelic hosts will rejoice over them with singing. But what are the qualifications of our citizens? Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates of the city. Revelation 22, 14. What are they to do? How are they to obtain this blessing? What is the condition that is required in order to retain and obtain his blessing? Do his commandments. <clears throat> Does this mean that we can set aside any of the commandments? Negative. Does this mean that we can keep nine of the commandments and set aside one? Negative. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Are we to do this by lip service or are we to do this in wholehearted joyous union with what he would have us to do. John in the Revelation writes of the unity of those living on the earth to make void the law of God. How many classes are there? Repeat. How many classes do we find on the earth? Well, there's two. two classes. Two. <clears throat> so if John in the Revelation writes of the unity of those living on the earth to make void the law of God, that means that there must be those that would raise up and live according to the law of God, not making it void. These have one mind and shall give their power and the strength to the beast. These are those that stand against Prince Emmanuel. They shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the false prophet. Revelation 17, 13, 14, along with 16, 13. All who will exalt and worship the idol Sabbath, a day that God has not blessed, Help the devil and his angels with all the power of their God-given ability, which they have perverted to a wrong use, inspired by another spirit which blinds their discernment. They cannot see that the exaltation of Sunday observance is entirely the institution of the Catholic Church. Um, just a note here. Now, I, I don't know why it took out of the mouth of the false prophet out of there, because it's in the, the Bible, but um, could have been a typo or something. But anyway, um, now when it talks about the mouth, what is that referring to? Would that not be referring to its legislative abilities? Yeah, so it's its legislative abilities. So you would actually have to have out of the mouth of the false prophet, because that's the primary action in which it speaks like a dragon. So um, I just thought it was odd that that was taken out. Okay, how is it taken out? 
Well, it's just not there in what you read. It says out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the false prophet. But it's supposed to have out of the mouth of the false prophet. Okay. So I don't know whether you just, uh, it's a typo or what happened, but it's it's just not there in what you read. Right. Because so, it, th this is copied directly from this manuscript. Yeah. So I'm just saying it's not in there. So it's, it's just a, um, a deletion not intentional, I don't think. Right. Right. But is it not interesting that coming out of the mouth of the dragon, yeah, legislative, coming out of the mouth of the beast, legislative, and out of that mouth of the false prophet, mm -hmm. again, legislative. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the laws of the world are going to be against God's law and against his people. Now, in this situation, was not Roe versus Wade against the law of God? Well, yes. Allowing for murder. Allowing for the murder of those that could not defend themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, and we know that God really doesn't like that. Uh, with what he did with, um, and, and not, I can't remember the fellow's name now, um, but the the guy that came up in the rear while they were coming out of Egypt and the Amalekites. Again, please. The Amalekites. Correct. He hate, he hates those people or hated that activity, and he waited a long time before he got them. God did not like the fact that, that the children of Amalek came to attack the rear guard of the children of Israel, where there were the weak, the aged, and the infirm. In this situation, we are looking at laws that protect those that are attacking the weak and the infirm. How, it, how can God bless a land, a country that are choosing to turn from his laws? Well, to my understanding, he won't. And from what I can see, he's not. Right. A corrupt union has been formed to tear down God's memorial of creation, the seventh day, which he hallowed and blessed and gave to man to be a sign between God and his people to be observed throughout their generation forever. A period is coming when everyone will take sides between the Sabbath of the fourth commandment and the Lord, which the Lord has sanctified and blessed and the spurious Sabbath instituted by the man of sin. An idle Sabbath has been set up as the golden image was set up in the plains of Dura. And as Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, issued a decree that all who would not bow down and worship this image should be killed, so a proclamation will be made that all who will not reverence the Sunday institution will be punished with imprisonment and death. Thus, the Sabbath of the Lord is trampled under foot. <clears throat> Can someone else read this next paragraph, please? But the Lord, the Lord has declared, woe unto them that decree on righteous decrees and right grievousness which they have prescribed isaiah 10 1 the great day of the lord is near it is near and hasteth greatly even the voice of the day of the lord the mighty man shall cry here there bitterly that day is a day of wrath a day of trouble and distress a day of wasteness and desolation 
a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trumpet and alarm against the fence cities and against the high towers. And I will bring distress upon men that they shall walk like blind men because they have sinned against the Lord and their blood shall be poured out as dust and their flesh as the dung. Now, if we were to look at this again, we would be finding this in Zephaniah 1. Right? The whole purpose of these Sabbath morning studies is to go through the minor prophets and to see their application. Here again, Mrs. White is comparing Isaiah 10, verse 1, with Zephaniah 1, 14, showing us the great day of the Lord. What are we to take from this? How are we to look at Zephaniah 1, 14 to 18 <clears throat> in relation to all that we are seeing regarding this coming abomination? Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them in the day of the Lord's wrath. But the whole land, the entire land, shall be devoured by the fires of his jealousy. For he shall make even a speedy riddance of all them that dwell in the land. Gather yourselves together. Yea, gather together, O nation not desired, before the decree bring forth, before the day passes the chaff, before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you, before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment, seek righteousness, seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. What symbolism do we see here? How should we accept this warning? What are we to do? Now a note from the chat. <clears throat> Please consider that this manuscript was written 120 years to the day before Parminder's ordination. What kind of warning is this to the movement? Well, the one thing, you know, that it's talking about here is, you know, if, if, I, if I think about this document in the context in which Ellen White is framing these, these statements, I mean, these are statements about the coming Sunday law. But she's not just she's not just merely making a an appeal that we need to keep the Sabbath. She's talking about a complete type of holiness. That we can't have just um, in a sense, some some of our religion can be sort of an idol that can make us think that we're fit for heaven and that we're going to be able to stand the trial that's before us. But this is a complete consecration of the person to wholeheartedly embrace God's commandments, not just the Seventh-day Sabbath or a few of the commandments that suit us or that make us look good in the eyes of others. 
So, you know, one of the things we saw with Parminder's movement was this idea that there would be no Sunday law. And it's sort of the logical progression of his, his philosophy. And, and, we will, and we see that in the church as well. Many Seventh-day Adventists do not believe in the Sunday law. Many are left uncomfortable with the idea that there could be a time that they would be separated from their idols. Mm -hmm. now, now, we have sort of two sides to this coin, too. So there are some who, who talk about the Sunday law a lot, but may not be consecrated in, in life. That is, their focus is upon the sins of others instead of upon their own sin. So they're, so they're unaware of their spiritual condition. So they may think, well, Sunday law is something that they're going to be able to pass. But, you know, this is not really just about Sunday. Sunday just happens to be the visible test. This is about, this is about character. Is it also not just about character, but whether or not we are willing to allow our character to be conformed to that of Christ? If we are not willing to live and to act as Christ did. How can we ever be fit for communication and to live with beings that have never submitted to sin? You know, it just dawned on me there's something to consider. If if beings that have never submitted to sin and have been wholly selfless um, and people from our day and age and in our um, background, our, our, our way of life, our behavior was to um, be around them, um, what makes you think that, you know, I don't know how we could believe that we could be um, respectful of their condition. We would be trying to take advantage of them everywhere we could. Right. Because that's our nature. How uh, could we live with them in peace? We would, they would, before long, there wouldn't be any of them left. Good points. Now, let us consider carefully the next couple of sentences. The Lord of heaven permits the world to choose whom they will have as a ruler. This is not an election. This is not a situation where you go to a battle, ballot box and if you don't get the person that you vote for elected, that you're able to complain. The Lord of heaven permits the world. That's all encompassing. The Lord of heaven permits all 
to choose whom they will have as a ruler. Let all read carefully the 13th chapter of Revelation, for it concerns every human agent, great and small. Every human being must take sides, either for the true and the living God who has given to the world the memorial of creation in the seventh day Sabbath, or for a false Sabbath instituted by men who have exalted themselves above all that is called God or that is worshipped, who have taken on upon themselves the attributes of Satan in oppressing the loyal and the true <clears throat> who keep the commandments of God. This persecuting power will compel the worship of the beast by insisting on the observance of the Sabbath that he has instituted. Thus, he blasphemes God sitting in the temple of God and showing himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4. Now, the admonition that is given here is for us to read carefully the 13th chapter of Revelation. I believe that we could easily each read two verses. So let's turn now to the 13th chapter of Revelation. I will begin reading the first two verses. If each of us in turn could then read two verses, we will quickly go through this chapter. But we will also discuss what we are seeing. So how do we decide in turn? Okay. Volunteer. I'll take the second one or the third, third verse, fourth verse, third and fourth. Okay. So what we will do as we read, we'll then discuss points that we see in the verses that we have read and leave this open for our instruction and for our discussion. So as it begins, and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns, and upon his horns, 10 crowns, and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. In the symbols that we are addressing here, we have a beast that is like unto a leopard, the leopard also having been applied to that of Greece. So this beast has an interrelation to that of Greece or upon its education system. His feet were like the feet of the bear. The bear that was, that was risen up had three ribs in its mouth. And a bear is known for its ability to crush and to tear. But the mouth is that of a lion. The mouth from the mouth. We have this ability to legislate. This beast rose up out of the sea. It did not rise up out of the land. So it came from among the peoples. It had seven heads. 
and the name of blasphemy are on each of the heads. It had 10 horns. There are crowns upon those horns. What do the crowns represent? And why would the heads themselves have the name of blasphemy? What can we see here? Well, first thing, we also see that the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Yes. So the dragon is the beast of Revelation 12, and that's pagan Rome. So the dragon has allowed its power to be given unto this beast. Yeah. Now, the way the pioneers understood this, I, I think was partly correct, but uh, partly incorrect. So uh, in Revelation chapter 12, because we went through this in our study on uh, the presidents of the United States, we know that they looked at the heads as the different forms of Roman government. And so in in at least in the dragon power, which is pagan Rome, um, that's the way that they understood that, that these heads represented uh, the different periods of time under which they had these different forms of government. And they would look at the seventh head as representing uh, the papal form of government. Now in Revelation 13 here, you have a beast that has been given its power. So this is papal Rome, but it still looks similar. Now we know that the, the crowns were upon the heads of the beast in Revelation 12, but they're upon uh, the horns in Revelation 13. And that's the 10 divisions of the Roman Empire. That's the way that it's understood. Okay. Right by the pioneers. So Rome is divided into these 10 kingdoms and those 10 kingdoms, each of them has a crown. So the papacy itself is not, um, it's a church, right? So it doesn't have the state power, it controls the state. And these names of blasphemy, um, one way that this could be understood, which the pioneers didn't understand it, that this refers to uh, the papacy itself, that these seven heads represent the papacy in some way. So at least that's my understanding of this. Okay. Now it's interesting from the chat that verse one is the 193rd verse from the end of the Bible and that the United Nations is comprised of 193 nations. Mm. Okay. Uh, so the seven heads we're determining that is actually the papacy. Why the seven heads? Would that be to do with like the seven last churches kind of thing? Well, I'm, I'm just saying that in some ways, because the seven heads in the the beast power represent the seven forms of Roman government, the, the pioneers continued to take that view for the heads of each successive beast, Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. They don't change the heads, but I'm suggesting that the heads must represent something else other than the forms of Roman government, because under the papacy, you don't have all of those different forms of Roman government. But but that's just a suggestion. I'm not mm. sense certain how to understand that. It'll come in time. Yeah. Verse three, please. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, which we take as 
1798, and his deadly wound was healed. When can we say that has happened? 89? How about 1933? I like that one. Well, I don't think you can put either of them. Okay. Why? Because it hasn't really been healed yet? Yeah. 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 It's he, 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 he still it, remains hidden. Yeah. Well, I would take it um, that this would be at the Sunday Law. Okay. Which makes sense. That, that was the position that Jeff had. He didn't like when people tried to have that deadly wound healed at some point in history. That's right. something happened. He would put it at the Sunday Law. Yeah, that's one of those instant kind of things. When it does happen, you'll know it for sure. So, and all the world wandered or wondered, wondered after the beast or... And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? Hmm. Now, it's interesting to me because the, the word in the Greek in Revelation 13, 3, that is translated as wounded. Mm -hmm. In the Greek, it's also slain. Slain? Slain. I got it. <clears throat> so. Well, wounded to death, that's, that's slain. Yep. So, and I saw one of the heads as it were slain to death. Is that not a doubling? Hmm. Mm. Would, it's, it's much it more goes it goes better than wonder or wounded because wound implies that he was just hurt slain implies he was killed well it can be slay, slain or wounded um, mm. the word you mean in uh, Greek yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it can be referred to being killed or wounded Well, if it was slain to death, it would be a doubling. And then it says, of course, the deadly wound was healed. That's a different Greek word, but that word is is a wound. Well, wasn't there a death associated with the Pope that uh, didn't he wasn't he didn't he die in exile? Yeah, he dies on August 29th, seventeen ninety nine. Pope Pius the sixth. Right. So that that actually would work slain to death. Or wounded to death. Yeah, but it's, that, it's that really, old guy. Though it's not talking about um, when it says one of the heads was wounded unto death. So it depends on what we define a head as. Yeah. So, I mean, that's part of the, the thing. So we would say, well, the head is just one of the heads. And, and we wouldn't say it's just one of the popes. It's not a singular pope that receives the wound, it's mm -hmm. the papacy. Now, just going back to about the seven heads, so there are different ways in which this is understood. We could take the pioneer view that these show the different forms of Roman government. And at that time, this first beast is under the papal head, and the papal head receives a wound. And, and that's a perfectly tenable sort of position they have. But it is also possible to look at this as, because even though we think about the papacy from 538 to 1798 as sort of just the papacy, it actually has different, it changes through that period of time. That is, there are different uh, classifications of the papacy uh, during this period, right? So you would have what they call the Byzantinian papacy mm -hmm. from 537 to 752 roughly. And so it has to do with uh, where the, what kind of control the papacy has, uh, where their government is, uh, uh, et cetera, right? So there's lots of different things that um, would determine this. And so there are seven distinct periods of the papacy from 538 to 
1798. And so that's that's another option. But I'm not saying it's the correct one. I'm just saying uh, that the papacy could be referenced as different heads um, from it during the period of 1260 years. Okay. It does make sense. I mean, because like you say, they had different periods, like the Byzantinian period on, on down the, the road. We know things changed and sometimes drastically. Yeah, different. Di times. Yeah, because different groups were in control of the papacy at different right. times. Right. And they were, you know, so you have uh, the Byzantinian, then you have the Frankish <laughs> influence, then you have the Roman families that were controlling the papacy from 904 to 1048. And then you have uh, the Emperor of the East, the conflicts that were happening there. So from 1048 to 1257. And then you have what they call the wandering popes. Um, but they start to live in different places. And then the Avignon papacy from 1309 to 1377. And, uh, you know, so there's different ways in which this could be understood. And so people classify these groups differently. Some of them would group them more in, together. Um, so, so it's just possible to look at this, um, you know, as some kind of uh, category of seven parts of the history of the papacy. But it, it could be that the pioneers were correct in how they looked at it as well. But what receives the wound is not a pope. Right. So it's not talking about a singular pope in this case. But, I mean, that's the main point I'm trying to make. Right. Because it, it, it wasn't just him. It was the power that was being wielded by that office. Yeah. That, that power went away. Yeah. So the papacy received a deadly wound. It's not talking particularly about what happened to the individual pope. Right. Okay. Tom and Phyllis, could you please read Revelation 13, 5 and 6? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Okay, now from the opening of the mouth, what do we see? As Speaking we were, great things and blasphemies. Okay, but were, did we also not address that? 42 months. The, the mouth legislatively. Oh. Oh. So we're dealing with laws that are against God. Symbolically, right? Right. How many times do we look at different laws that are against God? Yet they are passed, whether we're dealing in states or we are dealing in nations. We're also given this, this prophetic time frame where his power was to continue 40 and two months. Do we not see that also and relate that to the 1260 days? Yes. So if this is related to the 1260 days, is it also not combined and part of the 2520. Well, we think so. 
So is it not then a type of judgment that is upon not just the earth, but also upon the movement? Oh, it's tall, isn't it? Right. So that would say it's on the movement as well. So as he opens his mouth to blaspheme against God, they are passing laws that are not in God's order. Mm. They are passing laws that are blasphemous to the name of God and against God's tabernacle, against the living tabernacle. So when we look at this, And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. The alternate reading of continue to continue would be to make war. How long has this war occurred that we can see in history? where legislatively and directly war was made against those that would honor the Sabbath. Because this verse in Revelation 13, 5 also would have reference to the following verse in Revelation 13, 7. But this mouth, we find, was given reference in Daniel 7, verses 8, 11, and 25, and also Daniel eleven thirty six, which reads, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished so that that is determined shall be done. If we are speaking great things against God, we are aligning ourselves in the class that will not inherit the kingdom to come. Right? Yes. I'd like to add that every time we speak doubt, and I'm as guilty as anybody else, we are speaking against the Most High. Go back to that manuscript. Um, isn't that what she wanted to do, is to have every doubt and, um, removed? I can't recall what it all, exactly what she said but it was in that lines. She, she didn't want to have that feeling when she went down. It's up, up a little bit further. Okay. We need to decide where our trust is going to be. If we're going to be continually doubting, that God is leading us. 
then whose side are we on? Well, if we're doubting, we're not on his side. Right. That's the point. Theodore, could you read the next two verses, please? So which two verses do I read? Seven, uh, eight. seven and eight. Okay. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Mm. So when we're looking at this, that this beast is given to him to make war with the saints. I have found it interesting that we find references back to Daniel 7, verses 21, 25, Daniel 8, 24 and 25, and Daniel 11, 36 to 39. Are these not giving us indications that this is all part of the King of the North? I mean, Daniel 8, 24 and 25. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power. And he shall destroy wonderfully and shall prosper and practice and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. And through his policy, also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. And he shall magnify himself in his heart and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without him. That's pagan Rome, right? I would say so. Mm -hmm. But does that also not apply to us in, in what we are seeing today? Yeah, pretty much. And then with this. So that's repeating itself. In exactly. The, yeah. And which is one of our things is it repeat and enlarge. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship the beast. Whose names are not worked are not written in the book of life of the Lamb. Those that make the choice to agree with the beast will not inherit the kingdom to come. Well, and that's why the admonishment to go over chapter 13 and out of manuscript 7a, um, 1890, whatever it was. The one we'll just watch the reading. Exactly. Okay, Sister Angela, can you read Revelation 13, 9 and 10? Sorry, I had to leave the room. Sure. Nine and ten? Yes. 
If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So we have the assurance that God will avenge us. And give us grace to bear if we are to be martyrs. And since a martyr means a witness, we're supposed to be witnessing whenever possible. Now, how often do we find this? If a man have an ear, let him hear. No, hear. Christ said it in the Gospels well, fairly often. Here we are in Revelation 13, 9, and we find this repeated from Revelation 2, verses 7, 11, 17, and 29. Why is it repeated so often in Revelation 2? I guess the churches weren't listening as they should have been. I think it's also in Matthew 13, right? When he's describing the, the sower and what the seed does. But quite I'm possible. pretty sure it's also. Yeah, I think it's a part that sprinkles throughout the Gospels. Okay. I mean, when I'm looking at this <clears throat> from the earlier chapters in Revelation, Revelation 2, 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. 2.11. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. He that overcometh shall not be hurt of the second death. 2.17. He that hath an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone. <clears throat> and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saying, saving he that receiveth it. And in the close, he that hath an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. If we are hearing, we are listening. If we are hearing, is our mouth open? Now, James has a verse about uh, being more ready to hear than to speak. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. Okay. <clears throat> okay, now. <laughs> Revelation 13, 11, and 12. I need someone to read this, please. I can. Okay, thank you. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. How has this historically been applied? As the United States. Okay. Now, every time I, I read this verse, and I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. How did the first beast come up? Out of the sea, which was out of the people. And this is coming up out of the earth. Which is the land, which is actually uh, a land mass or an area inhabited by certain people. 
but it did not come up from the people. It came up from the land, right? Right, which makes the, it seems to me, it makes that the that beast is exercising all that authority. And if we have attributed it to the United States, it makes sense because, um, you know, first it was France and now it's us that are, is the world power, you know. Um, others try to buy for it, but they haven't yet achieved it. So why would this verse 1311 be compared with Matthew 715? Mm. I'm sorry, I'll look at the verse. Seven what? Seven thirteen? You said seven fifteen. Seven one five. Seven seven one five. Well, that would kind of make sense because we have a lot of false prophets in this land, which come to us in sheep's clothing because <laughs> they're they're professing. You know, they're Christians, uh, but inwardly they are ravening wolves because of the doctrine that they actually mislead you into. So as the verse reads, beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. It makes sense why they attached it to that. Or why they attached that uh, Matthew 15, this verse 715. Is to this that other verse in Revelation 13? Is this not an admonition of the Savior? Well, yes. I mean, it's the Savior that's that's given all this information. Is it not? Okay. Now from the chat, Matthew 7, 15. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. The Bible verse 23,332, reverse Bible verse 7771. The book verse is... <laughs> One eight seven. So here is a warning given by the Savior regarding July eighteenth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I what, do other, see that. what other symbols do we see here? Uh, well, we see the 777. I haven't, I don't know what we've attached to it, but the one, but. Well, we also have a, a, a mirror, 23332. Three, three, but, um, and the thing that's interesting too, of course, um, because a person could interpret this two ways, you know, July 18th is a false prophecy, it's false prophets. But of course, we're using a system of study that reveals this information. And July 18th, it's rejection was re rejected by a false prophet. That's the more I would go for it. Yeah. I'm just saying people could look at it different ways. But um, the fact that we're the ones who can look at the symbols and understand these um, and we already understand uh, the significance of false prophets as they have affected this movement. So we have the second beast. And he exercises all the power of the first beast before him and causeth 
the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, the wound was applied to one of the heads. Now it's saying here that this deadly wound was to the entire beast. Right. Interesting progression. The, what, beast, the beast, of course, has a head. Right. So the, the wound was in its head, but it still affected the entire beast. Right. Yeah, because the heads are all attached to one body. Yeah. Now, um, doesn't mean it doesn't have other heads, though. That, but anyway, um, one of the things I want to focus on here is this word earth. Um, because you have this beast coming up out of the earth. Now, Hebrew and Greek use the word earth in the same way. Um, that is, it can refer to the soil itself. It can refer to the world. Um, and in Hebrew, it's Eretz. It's a different different word. You hear it's Gi um, in, in Greek. Um, but the idea here is that you're going to have this serpent is going to be cast down to the earth, right, in chapter 12. Right. Then you're also going to have when this flood comes from the mouth of the dragon, that the woman's going to uh, flee and the earth is going to help the woman. And then in chapter 13, you have earth being used several times. Um so it can talk about, you know, those that dwell on the earth shall worship him. Of course, those are all those people everywhere in the world, right? It's not just talking about a particular place. Um, and he deceives them that dwell on the earth by means of those miracles. Um, but we know that the earth can also refer to the land and particularly the land of Palestine. So Eretz. Uh, can refer to Palestine or to a particular country even. Um, but when it comes up out of the earth, this beast comes out of the earth, we see that, you know, Satan was cast down to the earth. And, and this would have to do with the nature of the beast. So, I mean, we know it is the United States, which is the land of promise in the context of um, this Sunday law, especially if we go back and look at Revelation chapter 11, verse 40 to 45. It's it's where God's church um, is. It's where, well, not, you know, where the, the United States ends up being uh, modern Palestine in a sense. So when it it's, uh, comes up out of the earth and it causes those that are on, causes the earth and them that dwell in there therein to worship the first beast. Um, I think there's just something about the earth that we don't fully understand as far as a symbol. So, I, I mean, I know it means a place less inhabited, but, but that's not just what it means. Right. It, it would not, refer to the United States. Was not Adam created from the earth? Mm -hmm. So, in this in this symbol, is this not a symbol of a creation of something that God had originally created, but then was being created? by the adversary well, that makes sense it does have a, a poetic justice to it well i mean satan is the king the the prince of this earth the prince of the world right he's he's been cast down to the earth and he is trying to control the earth and all those that dwell in the earth
Okay. Now we've got Revelation 13, 13 and 13, 14. We need someone to read those two verses, please. You talking about Revelation 13, 13 and 14? Yes, I am. I'll read them. Okay. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceive them that dwell on the earth by the means of the those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound but but by wound by a sword and did live. Sorry about that. No problem. Thank you. And this beast, and he doeth wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. This beast, the second beast, the one that refers that the first beast should be worshipped maketh fire come down from heaven in the sight of men. And he deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast. His deception is done in full view of the first beast. How are we to see this? How are we to apply this symbolically for our time? And the verse continues, saying to them that dwell on the earth. So if he's saying something, is he not speaking? And if this beast is speaking, is it not legislating? legislating to them that dwell upon the earth that they should make <clears throat> an image to the first beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Is this not giving us a representation of the legislation that is soon to come? So um, I was looking at the word fire. I put it in the chat there. Right. It's used to know destruction and justice of God. So this is a false fire that this beast is bringing down. Right. Is this okay? So we can we can look at it in that pick in that in that symbol that that fire is. Um, you know, the wrath of the church or, or the wrath of what they consider to be God, but is not. Okay. But isn't the isn't it the church that the stuff that goes through the church that perpetuates into society that ends up, you know, uh, forming the opinions of presidents and kings? Hmm? In some ways, yes. Exactly. And this is the cause that happens, uh, or this is the effect that happens from that cause. Wouldn't you agree? I wouldn't disagree. Okay. So there's a lot of symbology there in those, those two verses. 
there's a lot here to unpack just as we really uh -huh. don't fully understand no, the we're just getting a grasp of it yeah it's like a finger hole climbing that uh that rock faced you know because that's exactly what we're doing we're, we're just a bunch of free climbers at this point we get up to a ledge and we start talking and you know telling about our experiences well and then move on up that ledge up that face the whole purpose of studying the minor prophets is to go through mrs white's admonition mm -hmm. that these minor prophets should be studied in conjunction with the book of daniel but if we're going to study daniel are we also not to study revelation they are one book for they are one book so when we're looking at this warning from zephaniah and we are looking at the 13th chapter of revelation are we not then studying as mrs white would have a, have us understand is our duty to do absolutely isn't that our cause? Yes. We need to more fully understand this because we've only begun to scratch the surface of what both Daniel and John have been telling us. We need this to be more relevant for us today. So that as we're looking at these studies, whether we are looking at the Great Reset of 2030, whether we are looking at what the book of Judges is telling us, that we can see them all working together as parts of the same whole unit to give us the warning and the information that we need for our time today. Yeah, all this stuff is for us today. There's so much of it, though. <laughs> there is. Okay, we have Revelation 13, 15, and 16. I'll take that. Thank you. Revelation 15 and 16? 13, 15, and 16. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast that the image of the beast should both speak and cause <clears throat> as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads. Now, there are many that would look at this as being literal as i grew up as i came to understand this initially this is figurative that the mark in the head in the forehead was the agreement the mental agreement to accept the law the pronouncement that was given and that those that accept this as a mark in their right hand would then work according to these pronouncements. Why is it important that it is a mark in the right hand rather than the left hand? Well, isn't that the um, hand that gets raised to God uh, or the uh, hand that is offered um, as an agreement in a contract? You mean in a covenant? Yes, uh, which is a covenant, which I, which I term a contract. I'm sorry. Sure. But we've been looking at, at the covenant as well the covenant with God, which was entered into by the children of Israel. Yeah. 
And it was a verbal contract, but the contract is a contract is a contract. <laughs> so it's a, covenant. it's a covenant. And he had the power to give life unto the image of the beast. He had the power to give breath unto the image of the beast. If you have breath, can you not make a pronouncement? Can you not speak? Well, that's how it works, isn't it? I would say so. I mean, the, the air goes up over the, the uh, resonant um, cords that we use to, uh, along with our tongue, right. um, to produce noise that we call speech. Right. All the symbology is there. So interrelating this, we would have Habakkuk 2.19. Woe unto him that saith to the wood, awake, to the dumb stone, arise. It shall teach. Behold, it is laid over with gold and silver, and there is no breath at all in the midst of it. Yet here is an image to the beast. Not the beast, but an image, a symbol of the beast to which the second beast gives breath. So that that image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Are there any other symbols here? Well, not here, but it's, yeah. I think a little in a different spot. No, there it is right there. Um, <laughs> the image, um, wouldn't that have to do with something to do with that beast that, uh, or that, that, that person that would change times and laws? Right. And so um, don't we see that that law, it would be one of the, the royal law, as James puts it. Um, and wouldn't it seem fitting <laughs> to change the one that's the only one that's told to remember? Agreed. Yeah, I mean, I see it as the Sunday myself as being that image. Now, if we look and, and that's the one that the church uses as a as their boast of being the church because we changed the Sabbath. Exactly. Hmm. Revelation See. 13, 6. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. That's pretty much everybody, isn't it? I'm, I'm sorry, Revelation what? 13, 16. Oh, 16. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought you said six. I might have. And he calls it all, both great and small and great, rich and poor, free and bond. Are that, is, does that not describe everyone? Pretty much. To receive. And instead of receive in the Greek, that he gives them a mark in the right hand or in their forehead. In other words, here is a gift. <laughs> he gives them. All right. Give gift. He gives willing, them. willing acceptance of this mark. But again, it's mostly from ignorance that they accept it. If they would know, if they know the truth, I'm pretty sure that they wouldn't want to accept it if they knew the truth. But they don't because it's never the only people that give out the truth is it's very, very small groups of individuals. Right. Exactly. Because of one thing, you know, you're attacked as soon as they open their mouth about it. 
I've had that experience and over and over again. I mean, I can hardly get it out of my mouth before I'm attacked on the Sunday as opposed to Sabbath. Nobody wants to hear um, the explanation or the, they haven't got time for it basically. And that's why we have King because I don't have time to, 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 to contemplate all that stuff. That's what he's gonna do. Okay. And I'm okay with that, right? <laughs> that's, that's the way of man right now. Most men, I mean, in democratic societies, Okay. Now, I'm going to ask, do we have do we have a little time to go further or shall we close our meeting today? What say you? Well, do you want to go like for how long? I'm seeing maybe another 10 minutes. I don't, I don't have any understanding of of what's going on afterwards, but I would say, yay. sorry. I think I think we should. I think we should stop. Okay. It's a good place to stop. Okay. Then we. What we will do is we will return to this this next Sabbath because we have one paragraph and two verses yet to read in this portion. <clears throat> And the document that will then be used as well this next Sabbath <clears throat> is one that has some very blunt points for us to consider. Any other comments of what we've been addressing today? No, but what, yes, what document is that you were talking about? I'll make Did sure I that I document? send this up. I'll send this up to Theodore. Uh, this is a completely unpublished document in, re in reference to the Karanabon school, but I believe it also has relevance for us today in the school that we are currently in. So any other comments or questions? No, I, go ahead i would say i've been blessed by it and i appreciate your efforts everyone well this is this has been all of us together today a group effort and this is what these studies should be i thank you each one that has participated i thank each one that has listened and ask that we be able to return again this next week so that we may conclude this and then proceed further. Shall we pray? Loving Father, we thank you for these times and these warnings. We thank you for the many blessings that you are providing. We need you, Father. We need your direction. We need you to show us that which you would have us to do. Help us that we may learn, that our minds may be open to your instruction, that we may become more fitted for your robe of righteousness, for your character, to give the message that you would have us to give to this earth. Be with us as we depart now. Guide us in all things. For this we thank you and this we praise you now and always in Jesus' name. Amen.